Commissioners, the next item on your agenda is item 2.02, .02, the discussion for public safety, a collaborative summit. Uh, Carver Center, Chief of Police. Susan Lowry, a health officer. Jason Sauter, Director of School Safety and Security for the Charles County Public Schools. Troy Berry, Sheriff of Charles County Sheriff's Office. Tony Rose, Chief of 911 Public Safety Communications. Guy Yesse, Charles County EMS Chief for the Association. Mark Hoffman, the County Fire Chief for the Charles County Firemen Association. Dennis Mills, Special Operations Chief for Charles County Volunteer Firemen Association. Ryan Degree, President, Professional Paramedics, EMTs of Charles County. Tony Covington, State Attorney, Charles County. John Elliott, President of the Toronto Water Police, Charles County, Lots 24. Thank you. Thank you. If you looked at, at the agenda, it says FY20 budget priorities. And that, for the most part, of, is what we will be discussing today. Uh, Bill Stevens, Director of Emergency Services. Uh, as I said, three main priority areas. Clerical support for our EMS division. We've got 92 personnel in that division. They do not have anybody to provide clerical support and payroll and, and things of that nature. The second highest priority is our communications division. We've undergone a lot of upheaval and turnover. Uh, we're growing very quickly, and we've asked for additional dispatch personnel to support the sheriff's office and fire an EMS in the field. Uh, our third priority is we always need EMS crews. Uh, the volume of business out in Charles County for both ALS and DLS is growing exponentially, and those are the three top priorities. Volunteer Fire Association. Yes, uh, like uh, Sheriff Barry said, thank you guys for holding this summit. This is uh, very nice to see all the faces in the room and everybody get together. Um, our, we have a few priorities. Some of our, uh, our top priorities is um, uh, retaining of volunteers in the county. Um, we have a few things in place that I think we can improve on. Uh, we have plans that we would like to push towards the county and ask for some county support. Um, Obviously, the more volunteers you have, the more money it's going to save to the county. Uh, you're always going to need your paid EMS crews, like Director Stevens said, uh, you know, to, to fill in the voids. I, I can't speak for EMS, as I'm just only here to represent the fire. Um, uh, just like Sheriff Barry, we need the same IT and uh, mobile data terminal support. Um, we don't have that in Charles County for fire and EMS. Uh, the Sheriff's Department has their own division. While uh, we can't really rely on them. That's we need our own support for that. Um, uh, infrastructure throughout the county. I know that's probably big in the county commissioner's eyes, uh, but uh, we have sent in some data to uh, push some things for like Billingsley Road upgrades. Uh, having these fire trucks and ambulances going down the road, it's creating hazard to the community and hazard to us going up and down the street. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure as you guys go through that process in the budget. Uh, you know, it's hopefully something you guys take a look at is the infrastructure of the county. Uh, finally, uh, we're working with PGM right now to update the plan review process. Uh, one other thing that we need to get support from the county on is rural fire suppression. Uh, there is a very limited plan about the rural fire suppression in Charles County. Uh, the main thing we need to go back and look at is uh, maintenance of the system. Instead of relying on the fire departments or relying on the communities to do it, uh, asking the county for a little bit of support because those things can get kind of expensive. And when you, the, the volunteer fire system has not changed the fire tax money in over 25 years, uh, so we're still operating on the same money we were back then uh, when it comes to tax revenues. I mean, obviously, the more taxes that come in, it can go up, but we don't receive 100% of our funding. This year, we received 84%. So... Uh, for us to keep digging into the pocket and, and already a strained system, uh, it, it might be time to ask the county for some support on the rural fire suppression. Uh, Emergency Services Association. Um, I can echo a lot what everybody's already said and just be very repetitive. I do want to thank you for having us here. I think it's extremely important to have all the right people in the right room to bounce things back and forth. Um, a lot of times when we talk about fire and EMS, it's really fire and EMS. So I don't want to go over everything that Mark Hoffman, Chief Hoffman went over, but I do want to say that there were some of my biggest priorities is our MDTs. A lot of our MDTs are far beyond their shelf life. Uh, we're having 
almost daily issues uh, keeping our entities running on uh, just the screens themselves are going bad. And those are things that are vital for us to do our patient care reports and everything else and even getting to calls back and forth. It, we think it's really important that somehow we invest in that. We work with DES and um, trying to come together to not only support the MBT purchase for all the volunteer um, apparatus, but also for IT support to maintain those. Um, we, we feel we maybe in the best interest to have the county look at that for security, firewalls, and everything else to have them oversee and manage that with us. So we're trying to have a collaborative effort to make sure that all the ambulances and engines are staffed on our portion, but also have the right tools and capabilities to make that staffing work. So that's my number one priority being getting MDTs. A lot of the other things um, I could echo again, what Chief Kaufman said, is the budget. Uh, I think we're at 79.6 this past year. Um, but we're continuing to make efforts and strides to look at every single line item and how we can properly um, reallocate money if we need to or redo the budget for the following year. So we're very involved in trying to make sure that it works for all the volunteers. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. Um, as far as emergency services, what's the, um, I, I'm sure it's traffic accident, um, but where do you find the most I guess, horrific traffic collisions. Um, and do you have the manpower and resources to, to um, I guess, send out to those areas where, where, where they happen? I, I, it dep yeah. You really can't pinpoint. Yeah. I mean, it's between the major arteries, I mean, the arteries of the county, especially during your, your rush hours. Traffic times. I mean, you get a lot of fender benders. Mm -hmm. uh, the serious accidents. I mean, they just honestly they occur all over at any time. Um, it, when you talk about w kind of what you're leaning towards, like mass casualty incidents, mm -hmm. uh, I think we're very fortunate that they're not as great as they could be, especially with commuter buses, school buses. Um, however, like Sheriff Barry said, with this act distracted driving, uh, you, you know, a two car accident quickly turns into six or seven. Um, I think we're, we're pretty well equipped. Uh, I can't speak for the sheriff's department about, uh, you know, traffic management and all that. Uh, but that's always in our mind when we get there. It's, I, I, it's a burden for the citizens when we shut the road down, but we're doing it for our safety. Um, mass casualty incidents in themselves, I think it's something we've discussed um, and, and with Department of Emergency Services is looking at a way to, to mass transport patients instead of tying up multiple ambulances for something like that. Uh, especially when you have 10 to 15 walking wounded, as we call them, it's easier to put them in one vehicle. And if we can't get them to one facility and get them triaged there, get them out of the, the hazard area, and it leaves our ambulances available to continue to handle the everyday responses. I'm going back to the second half of your first question as to if we have enough resources for these incidents. On the EMS side, bluntly, we do not. Uh, one of the primary examples we're talking about is traffic incidents. Um, it's not a secret. Most times these include multiple people, multiple injuries, multiple patients. Um, just last night we had a significant crash over on the west side. It took, I don't have the exact times, but I took multiple dispatches trying to get a second ambulance there to take care of the patients. This is a normal, I know, multiple times a day happening that we simply do not have enough EMS staffing to get there, take care of the citizens. Um, even going beyond the traffic incidents, basic medical calls, and it can be, I've personally, in the past couple weeks, I've been on scene as a first EMS unit there, 40, 50 minutes into a call. Um, that's our family, our friends, that this is a, and can cost their lives, ultimately. To do, um, put that in a little bit of perspective, we have um, a lot of people that are paid and volunteers that are all going to one location, and that's the hospitals. And our hospital is consistently, uh, due to staffing and rooms, are constantly in yellow and red. You don't have to take my word for it, we can print out a report showing the amount of hours every single day that CRMC, for example, is yellow and red. So that means yellow and red means we should be going there because they're full. And then you have to look at the other surrounding hospitals, they're all yellow and red. There is once or twice a week where we literally see every hospital is yellow and red. So where we take the patient, we have to take it to the closest facility, and we will literally spend three to four hours standing in the hallway 
Now, while all those resources are standing in the hallway, they're not responding to motor vehicle accidents or people's homes for a medical call. You only have some of the resources. And getting them out of the hospital and getting them back is really a key to this. You have one hospital in the county and limited staffing and resources there. There's only so much you can do. So as much as we talk about the other units that are available, it's also, they're, they're tied up other places as well. So it's a bigger picture than this. It's a lot bigger picture. So you have to stay there until they say, okay, they're released in our care, and now you can Correct. leave. Correct. They have to have a, quote, unquote, a bed for them. So until I put the patient in the bed and have her turn over to the nurse, you're not the nurse. Thank you. But <laughs> <laughs> I turn it over to the nurse and they sign off on it, legally I'm allowed to leave that patient. But until then, I'm standing on the wall. And there's many times that all your EMS providers can attest to that there's five, six, seven standing on the wall and we have to go to reroute and you can't reroute if you have no place to go. So our folks stand there for hours. And that is a regular, as a volunteer, it is difficult for me to tell my volunteers, thank you for volunteering. And they spend three hours on the wall. Well, I'm not gonna do this again. And that's not what they signed up for. They signed up to take care of our community, not stand in the hospital for hours on end. And I know it's a give and take, and we try to really educate our folks on that, but it's really disheartening to a lot of them. This morning, coming off, off my 24-hour shift, I was sitting there thinking in my head, in a 24-hour shift, I spent over a quarter of my shift standing there at the hospital, just waiting for a bed. Um, to take it to another perspective as well, just taking our priority one dispatches, our highest level dispatches, the FPA has standards for the amount of times that we're, amount of time we're supposed to be there. We're hitting that standard 43% of the time, which is scary. Does so, anybody try to talk to the hospital, see if they can work something out, some kind of... We have regular meetings with them, and uh, we are constantly trying to find ways of improvement, but the reality is, is simple. Um, and the hospital will say the same thing that we're going to say to you. you got to have more than one hospital. I mean, there's just so many beds that ER can possibly manage. And they, are, they have expanded. If you've been familiar with CMC over the last 10 years, they have expanded twice, mm -hmm. and they still they can't have. manage the capacity that the EMS providers can bring in. You know, over a course of some hours, um, like so a lot of times between four and six and seven, we can have 30 calls all going to the CMC. They already have all the um, beds filled, or 75% of those beds are filled, they're overwhelmed. So we have regular meetings to try to see if there's something we can do to possibly help them, and we're constantly working on that. Uh, and then, we'll, we'll walk in, take a patient, right the triage. Hey. Mm -hmm. They don't need a room. <laughs> We're going to write the triage. We do what we can to really try to help them. And the same things that the EMS, fire and EMS is experiencing. When we having folks that are having mental health episodes, and if the ones that the hospital uh, are not taking any additional patients, we have to go to Prince George's County, which they have their own issues. Calvary County, they may have their own issue in St. Mary. So we tie up resources, um, unfortunately, because they do not have the capacity to take them, the, whether it's the uh, ALS or BLS issues that you guys are dealing with or the mental health issues that we may run across also. Which might be an entire shift. Yes. You might yeah. lose that also. Yeah. Might lose also yeah. entire shift until a bid opens up, whatever the case may be. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to um, comment on was the EMS services. Um, it's no surprise to the folks in this room that I've been a, a champion for EMS services and the need to increase our bodies and to increase our equipment um, from purchasing a new ambulance, state of the art, to having our EMS classes bringing in more EMS folks. <clears throat> and one of the things that I still stand by that I find that was very important for us to do, I know some folks didn't agree with the decision, but we publicized the call times by districts. And so um, when we were able to do that, and we did that monthly, to show the public, it was actually a report, especially for the commissioners, but to show the public the need for an increased funding for EMS services. Um, it shows that not just in, let's say, the most populated area, Waldorf, we need additional EMS services. You, we have to, and I think it has been um, shared today, you have to understand the domino effect because if all of the cars are being utilized in Waldorf because of the population, when there is another call that comes from White Plains or Waldorf, then they have to go out to surrounding areas to call for another call um, to come in. And so if, they're, if we're calling down the street to La Plata and La Plata has to come and service someone in Waldorf or, or White Plains, then when something happens in La Plata, 
then that delays the, um, the call for a resident in the Plata. So I just continue to urge my colleagues to understand that this has been one of my priorities and it will continue to be one of my priorities to increase the number of folks that we have in EMS to make sure we do support the um, department with the, um, um, the training, but then also the, the, the equipment that goes along with that. And then like we've done in the past with the fire department, especially with the volunteer EMS, we need to make sure that we are creatively supporting their needs for additional equipment to make sure that they can um, service the community. Uh, one of the things that we can't forget, and I know folks in this table um, know this, and I'm saying this publicly, but like you mentioned earlier, we do have some rural areas that take specialized equipment um, to get to certain areas. And I just want us to be mindful and be even to support um, when we can those requirements. So thank you. I just thank you. I've, I've said it you know, to you before, but just thank you for everything that you continue to do. And I'd like to also hitchhike on a point that uh, Commissioner Stewart is making in reference to everything is evolves around each other. And I know a lot of decisions have made been made years out in regards to planning of some communities. And I, all my counterparts will understand this. A lot of times when we have building codes in reference to communities and subdivisions and everything, they are they have the uh, mindset there's a uh, uh, topia kind of scenario where there's no cars parked on the street, being able to get back to the end of cul-de-sacs and everything like that. And we have to be very mindful as we go about building out, building out our communities, new communities that are coming online, about being sensitive to getting large equipment into, into those residential communities. Because right now, where everyone's at work and everyone's doing what they're doing as far as uh, uh, not at home, it's easy to get ambulance down the street. It's easy to get fire equipment down the street. I have some large equipment that we can need in emergency situations to get down the street for, oper op uh, for officers' uh, op operations. And we have to be very mindful that when people come home, there's, for everybody that's a driving age, there's a car in the community. So there may not be not any cars in the driveway, I mean in the garage, but everything's parked on the street. And we can't get down to any of these cul-de-sacs and things of that nature. So as we move forward, I, I think that we really need, as far as a, a portion of this planning, law enforcement being at the table, fire and EMS being at the table, uh, and, and have a conversation about how we go about planning and structuring these communities in reference to um, uh, fire apparatus. And Another comment. Thank you for bringing that up, and I forgot that. Um, I was having a conversation with some um, emergency medical service um, folks, and they brought up, again, recently, something that Sheriff Barry just mentioned, and it's about how tight the new developments are. And I always use the development that I grew up in, Pinefield. Pinefield is very ideal because most of the roads are Y. Um, the, the, the road, the development I live in, if, if, the car, if two cars are parked on the side, it's hard for a large SUV to get through the middle. And so the requirement based on state co county code is 24 feet across from curb to curb. And I brought this up before, especially when we were doing the comp plan, and I got a lot of pushback. I got a lot of pushback from developers. I believe, I support, and I'm telling my colleagues this especially, I believe the county code should um, be changed to increase the requirements of the width of the roads because I've seen it. Um, um, my next door neighbor had a gas leak and you know all of the pieces of equipment you send out for a gas leak, and they could not come down on our road. They couldn't um, because of the cars that were parked. So I challenge um, uh, my colleagues to really um, to, to put forth an effort to change the county code to make sure that as we move forward, new developments that are built, the requirement is larger than 24 feet because you just cannot get the equipment down the roads. And we actually can give you documentation to support that. Um, if you're not familiar with Sugarberry, um, relatively yeah. new, um, we have had several times where apparatus can't get down the street because of cars on both sides. Uh, I was going down there, couldn't get, I couldn't get the ambulance, much less an engine, so I told the apparatus to take <coughs> sour wood, so they all deviated into sour wood, they got blocked again. We were having to go back around and all around the community to get to a patient 
because literally multiple roads to one call was blocked. And that's on a pretty regular basis. Sheriff's, uh, Sheriff Harry's office is fantastic. We called them and they always sent several cars out there to get the cars off the street and moved. But at the time of need, it was, it was already too late. So I, I couldn't applaud you more. It, it needs to be widened because it's just not working for us. And they're all very, very tiny. And, you know, and um, I think because of the data that we can use about the delay in time getting to calls, I think it's, it's very appropriate for us to challenge this current code and do recognize that we'll get pushback from the building industry. Um, another thing that was a pushback that I received, even from the environmental aspect of the code, is that if you increase the, the, the footage required, you increase the impervious surfaces. And so I understand that, but the, you have, there's a give and take. When we have to, yes, be environmental, um, sensitive and and um, and recognize that portion but we also need to take into account the need to get emergency vehicles up and down the road and that is actually part of uh, design plans now for a lot of departments building new apparatus building tighter wheelbase fire trucks uh, the the tiller form of the ladder truck that you see that takes the two drivers um, mainly is because of those tight streets we, we've had to adapt uh, when the local chiefs do plan for views, even though the code says 24 curb to curb. Uh, every comment that goes back asks the developer in the county to look at increasing that just for that project. We put it in writing, and, and we support that 100%. And I appreciate your comments on that because that's it, it's truly a burden um, it nowadays. Is. It is. Thank you. And that, that same scenario applies in a in a number of townhouse projects mm -hmm. in Charles County where. There is no access to the front of the building from the street to the front door. The only yes. access is from the alley between it and another townhouse, mm -hmm. and sometimes you can't get apparatus in there for that same reason. And I think, <coughs> you know, some folks may not like me to say this, but I really think that conversations like this really need to be had with the public as a whole. Because I know personally myself, if I was looking to move and I look into a community, I think of EMS. Um, because of my personal issues where I've had to pick up the call in 911, that's something I look for. But I think some folks that are buying these homes and buying the townhouses, the last thing they're thinking about is call, needing to call the sheriff's office, you know, calling 911 and needing help from the ambulance or fire. If, if, if we had um, consumers thinking about this, maybe it would push the, de the developers to develop the property a little bit differently. Finally got the mic. <laughs> <coughs> Forgive me. First, I want to thank everybody for coming out. I really, I, I personally appreciate it. Um, I live your lives. Been doing it for 20 years, um, on on call and, and running at all times of the night. I think it's important. It was important for Commissioner Collins to have you guys here today and have this discussion. Uh, as we grow as a county, one of the top priorities is safety. In my opinion, I mean, people move to a community, look how safe it is. How are the public schools, and is it somewhere they want to raise a family? Every single thing you hit on were things that, you know, running in the campaign that I knew were important. And, you know, for me, personnel, you know, attracting personnel. Every single one of you is, you know, in public safety, it is harder and harder to get folks to want to get into this, these occupations. And I think it's important from my perspective for you guys to become more involved in the school system and try to grab some of our young people and show them, you know, the, what your career entails and how, how rewarding it can be. Um, from an infrastructure standpoint, I think that everyone at this table can agree that moving forward as we grow, the infrastructure issues from fire equipment, from police equipment, from personnel, from pensions, from everything is just it's this huge ball that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and we have to manage it. And we have to manage it in a way where everybody feels safe and everybody feels like they have a, a seat at the table which is something that I think today was a step in the right direction for everybody here. Um, I know I'm listening to you. I believe my fellow commissioners are listening to you, everything you have to say as you go into budget season. Um, you know, we can't give everybody everything, but hearing from you, and believe it or not, your voices are a lot stronger than ours. And when you go out into a community and you tell, you know, tell them things like, talking about roads, they're not safe. This is why we need this road fixed. It's because it's not safe. When you talk about why we need this improved, because we can't get our fire trucks down there, when you tell them, you know, why we need another hospital? Well, you have people wasting time sitting in a hospital waiting. If we 
find the resource, we have to be able to justify when we're going to spend the, the taxpayers' money, and you guys are our best advocates. And I just can't thank you enough for being here, and I, again, after 19 years, I, you're saying everything that, I don't want to say I know, but I know, and you're <laughs> telling it to everybody in the public and everybody here, and it, it kind of gives us a way to move forward. And just thank you. I appreciate it. Just to Hello. touch on what Sheriff Fair said, and to give you some perspective, <clears throat> on the western side of the county in District 2, you're normally assigned four officers plus one supervisor. The western side of the county is considered huge. Just to give you a point of reference, the same officer that responds to Bensville Road to Barry Hill Manor for a call is the same officer that's going to back an officer up at Chickamauxon Road and Route 6. That we have four officers, that, along with the supervisor, that are in that rural area. Um, that's some of the huge issues that we run across. And, and I know we have a lot of the bike paths in the, in the communities up in Waldorf. But, um, some of the larger, the, the rail trail bike path, things like that, it's hard for those guys to cover it because they're running from call to call, and they're covering hundreds of miles uh, in La Plata. Luckily, we have the town of La Plata in the actual town because you normally only have three officers plus a supervisor, or maybe you might get four plus a supervisor running from Billingsley Road to the bridge. That's a huge area for them to cover. And that's, that, that's why the sheriff said that we need to increase those parts of our county twofold easily. Appreciate that.